Hello and welcome to a Hypnotic Authenticity podcast. This one is on the subject of letting go of limiting beliefs. So this ought to be of interest, if I've done my job well enough, if there are things that you want to do, your willpower actually has direction. But for whatever reason, you're not getting down to it. You're not doing it. So it's as if there is a part of you that is wanting to go and do something, but there is another part of you which just for whatever reason seems to be running on autopilot and is pulling in the opposite direction. It's like an overzealous bodyguard that is constantly trying to keep you safe. And so you don't end up doing what it is that you, apparently you want to do. Okay, let's let's start with what is a limiting belief? Well, actually, let's start with what is a belief. So a belief to us is a truth. It's, it's a fact. It's a conclusion that we have come to which we believe to be completely true. Now, they're not written in stone, but they are very, very long-lasting. You know, so we have a belief today that the earth is round. We had a belief that the earth was flat until uncontrovertible evidence proved to us that the earth was round. But we're talking about that level of truth that allows us to navigate our lives. So when it comes to a limiting belief, it's basically one of those beliefs that is getting us, that is getting in the way of us doing what it is that we apparently want to do. So the limiting belief is almost like a chain around us. It's it's stopping us. And, you know, the likelihood is that it's stopping us in order to keep us safe. It's not as if the limiting belief is totally haphazard. It's, it's benevolent. It's trying to keep you safe. It's trying to preserve you for tomorrow. So it thinks it's doing a good job. So the question is, when you want to do something and this limiting belief is, is in the way, what on earth do you do with it? How do you get rid of it? So let's talk briefly about learning. Let's talk about where beliefs come from, where knowledge comes from, in order to understand how you can rewire your limiting belief, you kind of have to understand, first of all, what it is that you're up against, okay? What is your foe? So we learn through a variety of mechanisms. So I apologize if you've studied psychology and you know this far better than I do. I'm, I'm going to generalize, but at a general level, let's say, we learn th through actively paying attention. We learn through passively paying attention. We learn through implicit attention where we don't even realize that we're paying any attention at all. And the attention is directed either to explicit experiential events or it is directed towards implicit perceptions that we notice that come up. There's a lot in that one sentence, okay? Let's talk about experiences to start with. And then I want to explain this in the story of your timeline. So experiences are things that occur to us. Maybe things that we choose or maybe things that come as a complete surprise, but that we notice and we come to conclusions about. And these can be fabulous experiences, or they can be unexpected, uncomfortable experiences. They're all experiences, and we learn from them. You know, when you're a baby, you knock over a drink, and it floods the table, and maybe mummy screams at you, okay? You learn from that. These experiences give us an understanding from a very, very early age of what it is to be good, to be bad, to be naughty, to be safe, to be approved of, to be loved, unloved, disapproved of, what it is to understand um, disgust, 
You know, there's a whole variety of understandings, conclusions that we come to based around explicit events that you can describe. There are also implicit understandings that come to us even when we're not aware that they're coming to us or maybe we have a vague notion that they're coming to us because the thinking part of our mind is well apparently a very very small subsection of the computing power of our brain. So apparently our conscious mind can only hold within it at any one time between five and nine things. There might be a sort of a buffer, but at any one moment, that's what your conscious mind can think of. Whilst at the same time, you are perceiving everything. 100% of the day, you are perceiving inputs from your senses and coming to conclusions. But all of that is going on at the back of your mind. And it's only if something weird happens that that might kind of appear on the monitor of your consciousness, okay? So 99.9% .9 of these things are just occurring in the background and because there's nothing notable, there's no reason to bring it up to conscious awareness. Occasionally, they will come up to conscious awareness, you know. Oh, I'm cold. I need to put a jumper on. Something like that, you know. Somebody did something which is totally out of character with how they normally are. And so it kind of comes up to consciousness. But the vast bulk of things, they just kind of burble along in the background. But if you consider, let's consider as a simple example, systems, okay. Now, systems theory is describing the um, the environments within which we interact. So you might consider uh, during the time of your infancy and your, your early childhood, the family within which you grew up, the circumstance within which you grew up where you knew certain individuals, a system. And that at that time was very large in your mind. It was, it was your main system. And then as you grow up, you have your schooling, you have your, your school friends, you have your teachers. There is an environment under which we might, you know, generally call schooling, which is also a system. And then you get to university or to work and there are your colleagues and there are power and uh, disagreement and personality and all of these things sit within a system that we might call employment, call your job. We have lots of these systems and they're all kind of discrete and sometimes we find ourselves slotting into that system and playing a role. We have to fit into the system that we find ourselves in. So if we take that very earliest example, when you're very, very young indeed, you're in the family system, or however you were brought up, you're in, you're in a system, you're in an environment where you are essentially powerless. You can scream and shout, but you are dependent upon others to have your needs met. And so you must fit within the system. If you don't, you might not get fed, you might not get loved, you might not get your bottom changed. So you notice explicitly when people approve and disapprove of things that you do, okay? So that is experiential learning. But you also amazingly come to intuit the things which are not said, okay? Apparently, communication is 95% non-verbal. It's 5% verbal. The rest is posture, expression, you know, noises, little tutting noises, maybe, uh, a certain way of looking, a way of speaking or not speaking, the position of the body towards or away from you, and so on and so on. Non-verbals are massive. Taboos, 
things which are unspoken and yet are like the elephant in the corner of the room. So from a very early age, we implicitly come to conclusions about things that are not explicitly spoken, but we have a sort of an implicit awareness. And it doesn't necessarily come up to conscious awareness at all. This, this is why, you know, this is why adverts can be so extraordinarily effective, even when they don't have a message which you can recount afterwards. You don't even know what the message is, and yet you receive a feeling about the brand. Similar mechanism that's going on. So let's stick with the very, very early you. You'll have these experiences that are concluded based upon your actions as to what it is which is approved of, disapproved of, good, bad, naughty, safe, unsafe, painful, not painful, and so on and so forth. Then because you're part of a family system or an environmental system, you will conclude from that, from the actions of others, all of whom have their own motivations, their own uh, stories running inside their own head, their own choices as to what is good, bad, right, wrong, and you have to fit into that system because you are vulnerable. So that will lead you to conclusions as to how you fit, what you're good at, what you're bad at, what your role is. And then you go on, you know, as years go by, you develop, you find yourself placed in primary school or secondary school, you learn more, but you are still within a system which is kind of outside of your control. The infrastructure is larger than you. And so you conclude ways to thrive within that system. And this continues and continues and continues. But the whole time that it is continuing, you are concluding everything through the light of your earlier conclusions. So your very, very early knowledge is astonishingly powerful because the things that you already know, the things that you have concluded that you now take for granted as an incontrovertible truth, well, they are going to define the actions that you take in the future, the things that you take on and the things that you don't. And more importantly, maybe than that, they are going to define your expectation as to the outcome of that. And I won't go down the rabbit warren of what it is to interpret our experience, but your expectation of it has a very, very large part in what you look for and therefore what you find. So you tend to, as you grow up, you tend to compound, you nuance, but you tend to compound your earlier understandings. Unless something comes along which just shakes the etch-a-sketch and kind of says, that was completely wrong, you need to reassess. Okay, that can occur. But the majority of the time we seem to reconfirm and nuance our earlier understandings. Unless someone with a massive position of authority or some evidence comes along that, you know, incontrovertibly says, I'm sorry, the earth is round, the earth is not flat, and I can prove it to you because, yeah? So, so then your beliefs can change. But normally your beliefs continue like they did yesterday. Now, the way that we learn, it's, it's not that this is a problem, okay? This is an incredibly useful mechanism. This is how we learn, you know, I said that we can only hold in our conscious mind between five and nine things, and yet we learn so much. So the way that we do it is by coming to conclusions, handing it over to the back of our mind, and then using rules of thumb, okay? So now we can get into memory. How do we remember what it is that we understand? Because it's not as if each memory is held in our brain in a discrete little pocket. What happens is the memories are kind of, they're, they're placed in different parts of our brain 
because they are associated with things of similarity, things that are familiar. And so the way that we understand and relate our knowledge and come to conclusions is through associations with our with the things that we already know, with the things that are already in our memory. So we are relating new memories to old memories. End result being that everything that we think we know and understand and recall today, actually it's not as if we're just picking up a historical picture and running that in our mind. Actually what we're doing is we are we are gathering threads from areas of our mind that where they were stored. We are reconstructing them and therefore we're reconstructing and viewing that with today's eyes, with today's head. And so what we think of as a static memory, in actual fact, is never a static memory. It's constantly being placed in the mind in a deconstructed state, recalled with today's head, being reconstructed, being interpreted with today's head, and then put back into storage. So things are more fluid, is what I'm saying, than we think they are. But we end up with this conclusion today of who we are, where we have all of this knowledge, all of this understanding of what we're good at, what we're bad at, what's safe, what's approved of, what isn't. And the vast, vast bulk of that is handed over to the back of our mind for use when it's required. You know, we can't think of all these things at the front of our mind. Otherwise, we could never, ever drive a car. You know, we, 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 it's really hard to drive a car. But then once you're used to it, actually, it's completely automatic. You don't even know you're doing it, right? And, and this occurs with pretty much every skill that we are good at. If you talk to an Olympic athlete, they are not consciously thinking about the minutiae of achieving whatever it is, whatever goal it is that they are going for. They are kind of clearing their mind. They are clearing the channels so that all their years of learning can flood out, you know, unconstrained. So that plus this idea of as using rules of thumb to bypass masses and masses of computing power in our brain, which would be exhausting, leads us to be able to lead our lives, right? To, to, to get on and do stuff. But, you know, tragically, it's also the same process that we use for our unhelpful beliefs that end up getting in our way. And they end up stuck at the back of our mind and we don't even know that they're running anymore. They're just there. So I hope that gives you a context as to what it is that you're up against when you find yourself stuck, drawn away by a limiting belief. And I kind of already gave you the answer there, okay? So the way to shift a limiting belief is by somebody or something providing incontrovertible evidence that the belief that you have is just plain wrong. So the question is how do you do that? Now, there are loads of ways of doing this. And I guess we'll, we'll just talk about two or three because you'll get the general gist. The big one is when life hits you with a wet fish something awful happens and you have no choice whatsoever but to do something different. The dark night of the soul sort of approach, the oh my God, I have to change approach. The pain of continuing in the way I am continuing is screaming so loud that I must do something different. Because let's be honest, right? A limiting belief is tolerable. If it wasn't tolerable, you would have pushed through it. The sheer fact that it has a hold over you 
means that it's not sufficiently annoying or painful to whack out of the way, to hurdle, to dismiss, to say, I'm not listening to you again. Instead, the result is just about all right. And so you kind of end up with the life that you're prepared to tolerate annoyingly. So one of the ways, obviously, is this kind of dark night of the soul. Oh, I must do something different. That can be very, very powerful. But, well, let's be honest, right? Most people would rather not get to that point. My whole job is aimed at people not needing to go there. Or, or also, I guess, to pick themselves up and, and utilize that, that moment as, as, as effectively as they possibly can. But ideally... To, to get the life that they choose to without having to reach a crisis point. So how can you do that? Understanding that your limiting beliefs are tolerated. One is this understanding that we are as individuals, as human beings, the average of our peer group, okay? We are a social beast. We tend to fit within the expectations of, of the people that surround us. So one of the ways that you can actually broach your limiting beliefs is by sharing this with your peers and seeing what conclusions they come to because they might come up with some extraordinary conclusions that you'd never thought about. If they do, well, then you're going to value that. It might in itself be sufficient to shift your worldview. But what is quite likely is that you are sharing your life, your peer group, with people that actually kind of have similar beliefs to you. And that's how you are maintaining this level of tolerability, let's say, to your limiting beliefs. Because your peer group, that social sphere, that system, is almost maintaining it. It's, it's permitting it to continue. So what might be more useful rather than your peer group is looking for people outside of your peer group that appear safe. So it could be a mentor. It could be someone that you hold in high regard. Maybe it's someone who's been through something similar and has found ways to you know, hurdle to beat that challenge. It could indeed be podcasts, books, videos, something that shines a light on a different way to your usual way of thinking, which has resulted in things that otherwise you wouldn't have noticed. What about mantras? This is, this is interesting, okay? So, Kue, um, every day, in every way, I'm getting better and better and better. What a wonderful mantra. And you see people and they've got yellow post-it notes stuck on their mirror. Every day, in every way, I'm getting better and better and better. Today, uh, a friend is just a stranger I haven't met yet, you know? <laughs> so, so something like that. Here's the thing with a mantra, okay? Your mantra, if it sits within your belief system, it's plausible, you're likely to go towards it, but it's already within the system that you are trapped within. If the mantra is something that you aspire to, but that conflicts with your limiting beliefs, well, then it doesn't matter how many times you tell yourself that. You know, the overzealous bodyguard is going to pull you in the other direction. It's going to say to you, I know what you're doing here, and that's not true. So the only way that a mantra is going to work is if you can, if you can effectively reframe the story that is underpinning the limiting belief, then it can work. If you can bring a sense of open-minded curiosity, of humility, let's say, 
of gratitude for the things that you aren't yet aware of. Something like that. So that you are opening your mind to the possibility that what you're sure of, you no longer need to defend to yourself and you can give the alternative a fair shot. Then a mantra can work. Okay. So it depends upon basically the story which is running at the back of your mind when you are reciting the mantra. If it's in alignment, if you are prepared to dive into the mantra and give it a good shot with enjoyment, with gusto, then yeah, it'll work. If whilst you're saying to yourself every day in every way, I'm getting better and better and better, the rest of you is saying, don't be stupid, not going to work. What is the mechanism by which a belief changes? Let's say that your belief is it's hard to lose weight, as a simple example. Or diets are horrible, as a simple example. Or if I try to lose weight, I'm not going to be able to sleep at night because I'm just going to be hungry all the time. You know, something like that. So even though you would love to release this excess weight back to the universe, unfortunately, these stories in your mind say, that's going to be uncomfortable, it's stupid, it's not going to work, you're going to end up feeling bad, it probably won't work anyway, you'll just put it back on, all that kind of stuff. Habits, apparently, take about 30 days to be established. So, a bit like if you suddenly take up exercise, it's pretty tough to begin with. It's, it's tiring. It makes you ache, right? Similarly, if you're suddenly going to start watching the amount of food that you're eating, well, oh, I like this feeling, this sensation of being full up, you know, and suddenly you're restricting my ability to feel full up, and that doesn't feel nice. Yeah. So it takes about 30 days to recalibrate the way that you appreciate what it is that you're doing and to habitualize that to the point where it goes to the back of your mind. So what I'm saying is habits are slow forming. Beliefs, by contrast, actually shift in an instant but it might take a long time to get to the point where you are ready to be open to the possibility of shifting your belief. So the extreme example, obviously, is the dark night of the soul, where suddenly you're cracked open in pain or fear or shame or whatever it may be. I must change. I must change. You are desperate for a solution which is outside of what you normally do. You are ready to change. At that moment, the possibility to change your worldview is immediate. So, your intention and your psychic defenses to maintaining your current belief system are very, very powerful when it comes to dictating how and when your beliefs are malleable. But the crucial thing is that a should has to turn into a must. You must have your own leverage that says... I don't know where I'm going, but what I was thinking before isn't helping. There has to be another way, a better way. When a should becomes a must, you are open to change instantly. So if we go back to what I was saying before about you are effectively tolerating your limiting beliefs because they're not that painful. Otherwise, you would have pushed beyond them. There is a need to reframe that. So you can either reframe the goal. You can make the goal much larger than life. You can you know, fuel your imagination, come up with some inspirational ideas of what's going to happen when you achieve your goal. 
Go beyond yourself. Go to the point of, I will be able to make the world a better place, you know, whatever it may be. If you can make that carrot fabulous, that can be leverage. But most people respond to pain, you know. It's more the stick than the carrot, at least initially. So what can be useful is getting an idea of a catastrophe inside your mind if you continue to support this limiting belief. What is the end result? See, for me, the reason the limiting belief maintains its chains around you is because that is where your comfort zone resides. It's not good, but it's predictable. It's safe. And so you maintain it. So for me, one of the most powerful ways to push beyond limiting beliefs is to say this comfort zone isn't comfortable. This comfort zone isn't allowing me to live. It's not allowing me to thrive. It's not allowing me to experience surprise because everything's safe. Everything is predictable. You know, the more safety, the more security to have that you have, the more you crave variety. It's just it's just the way that we think of as as human beings. So I turn my comfort zone into a boring zone and have a gleaming goal that's drawing me towards it. So you know, you can acknowledge that to step outside your comfort zone is fearful because you don't know what's the other side of the comfort zone. So maybe you can chunk down the steps outside the comfort zone. But it is through experience that your worldview changes. You do something different. You come to a conclusion which is kind of surprising and you use that feedback to shift your knowledge. Now, the feedback could be good or bad, okay? When you do something different, it might be amazingly successful. It might be surprising. You might go, wow, that was amazing. It might not, it might be a mistake. But the point is, whether it's good or whether it was a mistake, you can measure and limit the potential for danger. So you choose something outside of your comfort zone, which isn't too far outside of your comfort zone but that will give you feedback so that whether it works well or it works badly, you've learned something new, you've progressed, okay? You can even, I mean, I, I will even get to the point sometimes of telling myself that even if it goes wrong, wow, I feel alive. <laughs> now, that might be a completely ridiculous delusion, but it is a way to allow myself to, you know, just step over the limiting belief and say, right, I'm going to try something which is nothing like me. But I boxed in the risks to a certain extent. I'm going to try something new and see what happens. Okay, Because that, the, the only way to change your worldview is by coming to different conclusions. And how do you come to different conclusions? Well, you have to do and experience something different. I hope that makes sense. It, the, the, the entirety of your understanding of yourself. You know, the, the reason that I go into hypnosis is because ordinarily our psychic defenses maintain a sort of a, a barrier around our deeply held beliefs. It's, it's almost like a protective mechanism within which, whether you want to call it the non-conscious, the subconscious, the protective parts of us, I don't know. But within that are, are the places that you feel safe, the, the, the reasons why you feel safe. And so you, you tend psychically to protect that. So with, the, with your critical judgmental faculty, with the chattering part of your mind, if you want to think of it in that way. When information comes to you that you find contrary to your beliefs, 
likelihood is you just flick it away. Straight away, you flick it away. You say, no, that's not right. The reason why I use hypnosis is because hypnosis quietens that part of your mind a little bit. It doesn't go away completely, but it is prepared to give you more access to your felt sense, to your intuition, so not exclusively your intellectualizing side. And so you can come to appreciate different perspectives in the full knowledge that that judgmental side of you still exists and it's sat there making sure that everything is contextually safe and so on, but gives you permission to kind of go out beyond where you might normally be limited. So that, that for me, that's a way of bypassing that limiting protective layer. But you can do it through your imagination. You can do it through leverage. All, all of these mechanisms work at the time that you choose for them to work. And effectively, this all goes back to what I was saying before. Is the limiting belief tolerable or is enough enough? Because that moment is the moment that the choice takes a split second. You don't necessarily know what's on the other side of that choice. You just know that this limiting belief isn't serving you anymore. There has to be a better way, even if I don't know what that is. And then you go out and explore. Because the alternative, either because it's ossifying, either because you're not learning anything, either because you're not growing, either because it's too painful to stay where you, where you are, any of those will work or bring your own. And when I do that, I'm going to know myself better. My life will be a richer, more expansive experience. Maybe I'll discover the joy and connection inside of myself. Whatever appeals to you, you end up with a compelling reason to do something different. And for me, that's where limiting beliefs evaporate. You become free to explore doesn't mean to say that you won't go back to the limiting belief. If it maintains safe, sensible, valid reasons, you can maintain it, but it doesn't need to be there all the time. You can draw upon it at will as a safety mechanism when that is valid, but you can also push on and use a different way of thinking or believing or experiencing when the different way serves you. The whole purpose of this is to give you more options, more flexibility, so you can try stuff. I hope that's of interest. I've been talking for a while now, so I guess I'll, uh, I guess I'll stop there. If it's useful, uh, subscribe. You know, I've got um, many, many videos on, on trying to make the world a better place, on, on trying to help people live a life that they really, really can see but can't quite taste. And, uh, and the number of podcasts is expanding weekly. So, uh, so yeah, sign up, have a listen. If you have particular thoughts, let me know. I would love to hear. I would also like your guidance as to what it is in particular that you're interested in. And that will guide my future conversations. So thank you very much and uh, take care. Until next time. Cheers. Bye.